We've put everything into this business. So we take everything quite personally. So um, knowing that we've then missed out on a seating and, and it might only be $200, it might be $300 for that person's booking. For us, that fucking hurts a lot. Like it still digs deep. You work hard, your staff work hard. We've got a booking system and if someone can't click on the, the link to say, actually, we've changed our mind, we're not gonna come. For me, that's just a lack of courtesy and a lack of respect. This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. No shows. They're one of the great profit killers of every restaurant. A seat held in good faith on a promise, but left empty as guests fail to show without even a phone call to cancel. Just as some restrictions eased allowing restaurants to welcome back customers in limited numbers, the great no-show killer cut a sway through many restaurants. Given we happily pay for tickets to the movies, the football or a concert, is it time to rethink the model for restaurants? Sally Sassy and her husband Nathan own one of Australia's and Adelaide's best establishments, Lee Street Wine Room. Sally, how are you going? Very well, thank you. How are you? I'm good. There's lots to talk about here and especially uh, no-shows and models moving forward, but I just wondered, you know, you have a fairly new restaurant which, um, you know, garnered a lot of support and a lot of um, excitement. Um you know, what was it like putting so much energy into an establishment and then something coming along like a pandemic and changing everything so dramatically? Yeah, look, um, look even just to start, I'm obviously new to hospitality. I've only been in the game for eight months um, as opposed to obviously Nathan who's been in it for nearly two decades. Um, so for me, I suppose – it was already a shock to the system as, as it is because we had opened up a new place, we had um, fitted out an entire new venue, put our life savings into it um, and obviously worked really hard up until that point. Um, I feel like, you know, Nathan was doing 80 to 100 hours a week, I was doing 60 to 70 um, and we had put everything into it and we were reaping the, the success and the rewards and you know we were at the pinnacle point of a lot of people when they open that restaurant and they just managed to get things right people are falling in love with it the place is booming it's buzzing and you know you're getting um really great reviews left right and center so we were definitely at our peak and then pretty much overnight it was you know um crash and burn pretty much um as we were with the rest of the country let alone um the world so uh, it really was quite devastating and, and to an element also quite traumatic. Um, I think you're invested so much emotionally, especially when it is your own business, there's no backers financially, that, um, you know, we thought we were doing the right thing by putting uh, everything we had financially, not taking out much of a loan, to then kind of be in a position where we felt we could lose it all pretty much overnight. Um, it was just... Yeah, devastating to say the least. What was the impact on those early days when you realised you had to close the doors? It was, you know, a government decision pretty much unless you do take away. Um, how did you feel at that time and what did you guys do in those first couple of weeks to deal with it? Well, look, in Adelaide it was pretty much um, like a slow death. It was – everyone was hemorrhaging. The government um, – the state government here in Adelaide still hadn't forced everyone to shut their doors. So knowing that – collectively as a community we um, weren't doing great and we knew we would probably be in a better position to shut down and actually hibernate and be able to control the costs um, by then being able to you know whether it's negotiating with landlords or um, looking at some type of government support we actually um, decided to call upon the government to um, hold a meeting here at Lee Street Wine Room so I actually got in touch with um, Steve Marshall our premier and organised with Duncan from Africola to get probably about 40 um, of Adelaide's top restaurant owners and chefs together. Um, and we kind of brought the reality to him where uh, I think in his mind he thought we hadn't yet reached that point. Um, but in that eye-opening moment we let him know that, you know, in that meeting we had let go collectively about 550 staff. Wow. Um, and this is before any forced closures um, had occurred. And I think – having um, him sit in front of us all and actually hear us say, like, 
we're begging, not even saying, we're all begging to be collectively shut down. I think it was a real eye-opener for him and it probably um, accelerated some of that decision-making because he, he actually wasn't aware as to where we're at. Um, he thought that we would actually be opposed to it. Um, so that was that – was, um, it was quite nice to see the community come together but it was also great to have our state listen to what we wanted as business owners and I think – Closing down was one of those things. It fucking hurts, don't get me wrong. You are having to let go of people. Um, for us in our position, we hadn't been open 12 months. So we, um, you know, had a lot of people who wouldn't be covered on certain um, government schemes like JobKeeper, for instance. Um, so that was a really difficult one. Um, I think for us being business owners, you have got a um, a sense of responsibility to your team to ensure they're looked after not just now during this pandemic, but also long-term, ensuring that we're making the right business decisions to reopen and reopen successfully um, so that we can continue to employ our team and potentially even employ others long-term. You've had a pretty wild ride for the last year, you know, uh, opening your first restaurant and then having this happen. You know, how how have you you coped with the last year and what's it it been like? (laughs) Look, it hasn't been too bad. I've been in – my background's in e-commerce and startup businesses, so I've learned to operate on a little to no sleep um, <laughs> already in, in my past background of business. So uh, I kind of slipped right into hospitality with ease on that. Um, in saying that, I have got a whole new level of respect for anyone in hospitality, whether you're back of house or front of house. I cannot believe, A, how fucking hard everyone works and even how hard it is just to be on your feet all day long. Um, But I actually can't believe the impact that hospitality workers have in the fact that they have direct feedback from guests in that element. So they're servicing, but unlike others who may be, you know, my businesses, I might sell a product online and it might be two or three weeks if I get some feedback. Sometimes I don't get feedback at all, but you're getting direct feedback from your guests in a real life environment and a real life moment. And I think that in itself can be, celebratory you know you can actually love it and you can you can live off the highs of that but if it isn't great you also feel it um deep within very quickly um and i think growing a backbone in this industry is something i've had to learn to do quite quickly um and it's something that i hadn't i had no idea about uh with hospitality that they they actually um it was quite such an emotionally driven industry that makes sense absolutely now your venue is long and thin and sort of elbow to elbow and you know you know to create amazing energy of you know the great wine bars um how how do you see the restaurant moving forward with you know restrictions and all of the various place things in place uh, as the government tries to open up society um how are you going to manage that Look, we're probably really fortunate looking back that we did decide to build such a small venue um, and that, you know, on the bottom level we're at a capacity of 36 people. Um, So we are definitely kind of counting our lucky stars that we didn't decide to go bigger and we decided to keep it intimate. I think there's been a lot of talk in the air as to um, whether it's 10 people or 20 people, like what's the point of opening, no one wants to sit in a dead restaurant. But I actually think for now that's almost becoming the norm and guests actually are okay with it being much quieter than, say, the average Friday night where we've often got a wait list um, and you are literally, like you said, elbow to elbow. I think at the moment guests are so invested in wanting to rebuild um, businesses and also for themselves be out and about that whether there's 10 people or whether there's 20 or whether there's 80, it's almost becoming irrelevant now. People want to be supporting chefs to, you know, get them back in the kitchen and putting great food on a plate or they want to be there to help support front of house staff and seeing them back on the floor serving wines, laughing and interacting. I think for us here at Lee Street Wine Room, one of the keys will definitely be ensuring that our guests are forefront of mind. Um, we have a policy that they're not called customers, they're not called patrons, they are guests and we treat them as if they're walking into our own living room. Um, and that means that the the interactions are genuine and, you know, we genuinely give a shit about them. And I think sustainability-wise, long-term, that's what it takes because I heard the podcast with Duncan um, a few days ago where, you know, he mentioned about you want to get the guests who come maybe two times a week as opposed to just once or twice a year. 
and I think that's what it is when you when you give back to these people and you invest in them and they can see that you give genuine service these are the people who are first and foremost in your corner to support you um here at Lee Street Wine Room one of our first visitors when we opened his name's Tim um he has been coming to us what when we were open at Lee Street when we closed and we did the Provador boxes he was the first um guest to to purchase one when we opened up Juice, Tra- Juice Traders Online, he was, you know, the first customer to purchase wines from us um, and he's now one of the first um, guests to actually um, make a booking for our reopening. And I think that's what it's going to come down to is ensuring that we are, um, you know, giving those guests that extreme, that, that extreme excellence of service that they, that they definitely deserve. It's not even what they expect, it's actually what they deserve. Before we get to what you are doing when you're opening up again, can we have a look at some of the things that you've done in the meantime to keep some revenue stream coming through? You just briefly mentioned the Providors box and stuff. Can you tell us what what you've been doing and what's involved in that? Yeah, so initially with the takeaway model, it didn't actually work for us um, in the form of doing food. Nathan's The food that Nathan makes is quite um, time-consuming to produce, but it also doesn't travel well. It's food that we wanted for people to enjoy in the restaurant. So we made the business decision that we wouldn't do the takeaway model. Um, in saying that, a lot of our suppliers, we had heard of stories where Gazander Oysters, for example, they were now selling their oysters at the back of their car on the side of the road. Um, and for us, that was wow. really heartbreaking to hear. Uh, majority of our suppliers are from um, small producers here in South Australia. So when we heard stories of that, we knew we had to do something, even if it was only on a small scale. We had to um, produce something that felt like we were at least um, doing what we could to give them a little bit of extra money. So with that, we produced the Provador boxes um, and we also did a picnic box. And they were just, you know, Uh, uh, produce from all our local suppliers um some wine from our local wine producers um and they were basically almost like a click and go so click collect and go model it was great for a couple of weeks um after that obviously uh as the industry was progressing everyone started doing a lot of produce boxes so the so the demand became less because there was obviously a lot more opportunity to buy even producers were doing them themselves so there was a lot more um, offerings on the marketplace. So it came to a point where we then decided, look, this is um, no longer uh, working in, in regards to a, a smart business model. We then wrote to um, the business, uh, the director of liquor licensing here in South Australia and basically requested a secondary license to be able to trade online. And that's where we launched um, Juice Traders. So selling our um, selling our wine list basically online throughout Australia, um, and that's now through this pandemic become a secondary business to Lee Street Wine Room, and it'll continue to do so. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah, so I know it's like it's almost like, and we look with that idea from getting the license approved to creating a whole new brand and, and bringing it to life was six days. So. I think it's one of those things where you're almost backed into a corner. You've got the, um, op- you've got two opportunities. One of them is fucking, you know, cry your eyes out and go, why me or why is this happening when it's really happening to everybody worldwide um, and sitting, sitting on your hands and doing nothing. But for us, we were like, well, this is an opportunity for us to um, reevaluate our business, what we have on offer and how can we, um, you know, even, even run Lee Street Wine Room smarter. When we opened and we grew so so quickly, there wasn't any time to actually look at things and see how we, we could improve them, how can we make things more efficient, how can we actually reduce costs, et cetera. We've used this pandemic to ensure that we have um, really accelerated both businesses, Juice Traders and Lee Street Wine Room, the best way possible. So when we do normalise and we do get back to trade, um, we can obviously do so uh, in a far better position maybe than what we were before we closed. When restaurants uh, opened the doors just recently and, you know, they allowed people in their restaurants again, you know, I think many of us were shocked to see that horrible no-show thing uh, rear its ugly head again, especially in these circumstances. (laughs) I just can't fucking believe it. (laughs) Can you give us an idea of what impact a no-show has on a restaurant? And then let's talk about a new model, something that you've introduced. Yeah. Look, it has a huge impact. I I mean, for us, as I mentioned earlier, we're only 36 um, seats. So even pre-COVID, we operated half walk-in, half bookings um, 
for our for our bar when the booking is set and you're expecting for that person to come and we often have a wait list or we have people coming up asking for a seat and we say sorry we're full um, and you're turning away guests who actually are ready to come down and sit and enjoy your venue to only then find out that the guest who's meant to show up has decided to not cancel their booking um, at all it really pisses you off it's, it's it's a complete mood changer and that's the one thing you've got to keep it in check because you're furious um, and it really puts you in a downer but you obviously have to keep your um, your head right whilst you're servicing but it can be annoying because uh, and again it maybe it comes back as well for this for Nathan and I this is we've put everything into this business so knowing our plan to pay back the money we've invested um, and be able to use this as a way to set up the future of our kids. We take everything quite personally. So um, knowing that we've then missed out on a seating and and it might only be $200, it might be $300 for that person's booking. For us, that fucking hurts a lot. Like it still digs deep. You work hard, your staff work hard. Um, And so to know that it came down to a lack of respect because basically that's what it is. We've got a booking system and if someone can't click on the the link to say, actually, we've changed our mind, we're not going to come, for me, that's just a lack of courtesy and a lack of respect. Um, With that pre-COVID, we did have a pre-auth amount. So we had $10 per booking initially uh, and we would charge. Like if anyone didn't show, I'll just do the full booking. If there's seven people, they get charged 70 bucks. Um, Post-COVID now, we've moved to a different model where it's basically it's a ticketed system. So we pre-sell um, a, a tickets at, for dinner service. It's 100 your way, so $100 per head. And that can be spent anyhow you like um, on the night. And then lunch times, it's $50 your way, so $50 um, per service. Uh, sorry, $50 per head. Um, and, again, they can use that how they like um, in that in that meal time. Um, but that just ensures that we're obviously making minimum spend for for that time slot. If someone doesn't show, our asses are covered pretty much. Um, like I mentioned to you before, not all of our staff are on JobKeeper. So we're actually having to pay staff wages for our entire kitchen team. Um, none of them made the, the JobKeeper. Front of house, I've only got uh, two people who are on JobKeeper. The others I have to pay. Um, so for us, every dollar counts. And if someone is going to cancel, unfortunately, with our new policy, um, they will lose. They will lose the deposit, which is a full hundred dollars. What's the response been to this system? You know what? It's actually been surprisingly good. I was a little concerned putting it out there, thinking because um, obviously what we're asking is for guests to have a, a new mentality to the way that you dine. Um, but I think. The fact that a lot of businesses or in hospitality and in the industry now are starting to roll out their own um, way of ensuring that the, there's a deposit or there's a pre-auth or whatever it might be, I feel as though it's slowly becoming the new norm. We haven't actually had um, anyone get upset about it. If anything, the guests here in South Australia have been phenomenal where they have actually you know, they'll send an email and say, hey, can I make a booking? I've got my credit card details. Half of them throw their credit card details into the email and they're like, take the payments, no problem. Um, so we've been very, very fortunate. Uh, this weekend, for example, all of our bookings have um, have booked out, so that's been great. Um, and we've just released the sittings for next week. Um, but it's a non-negotiable policy, a policy for us until we see restrictions um, completely lifted. You know, restaurants often take time, often years to grow into their bones and fill out and become what they're going to be. Um, And your restaurant was still quite young when the pandemic happened, um, although it was thriving and receiving like rave reviews. Um, Do you think this experience will change what you do with a restaurant moving forward? Um, Yeah, to some element. Look, it's probably going to make Nathan quit being a chef and he'll probably end up trading on the stock market to be be true. (laughs) I think the time out of the kitchen, he's gone from, you know, from zero to 100 real quick and he's just kind of gone, whoa, this is what it's like to have a life outside of the outside of the um, the walls of the restaurant. So let's hope we can get him back in there. Um, but look, in saying that, one of those things is definitely with myself and Nathan, we've um, discovered that there's a real sense of balance that we were missing pre, um, pre-pandemic and for us that means that when we reopen – we are going to ch- change some things up. Um, neither one of us want to spend every waking moment in this venue. We love it. Um, and, you know, it's it's been incredible for even the, the eight months that we had it. However, 
there has to be a balance because what we were doing was not sustainable. Um, and so for Nathan, that means um, gearing up a great um, a great kitchen team to ensure that he can have nights off and he doesn't actually, actually have to be chained to the kitchen. Um, for me, um, we've actually just hired um, Nikki Friedley from uh, ex Africola in Adelaide. Uh, so she's coming on as part-time manager and that will allow me to step away and actually spend some nights with my kids at home. So I think um, that's going to be a huge thing for us is ensuring that we have that balance not only for ourselves but also for our team. With the prepaid model that you, you're you introducing, um, do you think that we'll see something like that across the whole industry and will it take a big um, sort of drive from industry to change people's minds on that and not just at the restaurant level, but perhaps with producers as well and distributors as sort of everyone being paid up front. Absolutely. I kind of feel, look, with producers and um, distributors, it's kind of hard. We've got it now with our um, food suppliers. A lot of them are saying it's cash on delivery. They've had to change their model, which adds even more pressure onto, um, I suppose, you know, restaurant operators. Um in terms of hoping that this is going to be the new norm where we do start charging, whether it's prepaid um, tickets or whether it is cancellation pre-auth, I do hope the industry collectively moves forward um, in putting that in place because obviously if we're unified, it actually makes the norm um, easier to roll out. It's, it, for me here in Adelaide, a lot of um, restaurants already had it. So um, when we opened – we put it in place purely because we had experienced it. When we dined at other at other venues, we were obviously always putting in our credit card details. So for us, it felt normal. And I think um, the more that the industry can collectively do that, it's just going to become something that almost doesn't even get challenged or questioned because it's just what you need to do. Um, and like you you mentioned earlier, you know, you go to the theatre, you prepay for those tickets. Um, you go to the footy, you prepay for those tickets. It shouldn't be any different when you're going into a venue to sit down and have a meal, knowing that these venues have, you know, pretty strict seating times and a lot of them are actually got pretty strict um, seating numbers that are available. So I definitely would hope that people um, would, would put it in place to whatever degree um, they like, but as long as there is some sense of penalty if there is a no-show or a late cancellation. You know, it's um, been a pretty crazy little period for you guys and, you know, there would have been fears that, you know, your whole li- livelihood could disappear right in front of you. But um, what are the positives to come out of this for, for you and Nathan? Um, yes, yeah, definitely been um, – emotionally challenging I think you know we as I said putting everything into it and only a matter of seven eight months later feeling like it could completely collapse um, was definitely harrowing but I think given that period of time to just stop and reflect and go okay you know what we've done really fucking good we worked our asses off up until this point um, and this is the successes that we've reaped but what can we do now that will ensure that we can operate smarter and I think um that's the that's the the biggest thing for us is ensuring that when we reopen our doors, um, we haven't gone into doing that with say a lot of deferred debt, um, because our business model wouldn't work with having excess amount of deferred debt. So we've made sure that financially we've um, we've paid off what we could. If that meant taking out super, take out super. If that meant selling some shares, sell some shares, whatever we needed to do, we've done. Um, And I feel like going back into it, there's almost like a a weight that's lifted off our shoulders because we've utilised the time to to do the right things for our business Um, rather than just complain or rather than just kind of um, pot along. We've we've been proactive in in the recovery Um, and I think that's that's definitely great. And, again, for us personally, it's it's being able to have um, so much time together with our kids. So normally, you know, as I mentioned before, Nathan's been in the industry now for 20 years, but before it used to be me at home with the kids, Nathan at work. Um, if I wanted to see Nathan, we would have to take the stroller into the restaurant and say hi for half an hour while he's, <laughs> while he's cooking a wagyu on the, on, the, on the grill or something. <laughs> so so it's been really nice. My kids, my kids are like, oh, who's this? I'm like, that's your dad. <laughs> so <laughs> it's been really good for, um, for them to be able to have so much time with him. Uh, now as we reopen, I think – um, that's going to be something we have to be cautious of as well as to not 
almost uh, flip the script and go back to them not seeing him um, because he's never home at night. So that's where that whole balance piece comes into it. Um, so look, there are some definite um, upsides to what's happened and there's definite some real, you know, fucking low, low sides to what's happened. Uh, what do you love about what you do as a, as a restaurateur? It's something that's fairly new to you in some ways, but you know, what do you love about it? I just love fucking talking to people. <laughs> so it's really, um, it sounds, yeah, it's funny. I just, I just love having people come in and actually look, even with the fact that we are a wine bar, um, I know nothing about wine. <laughs> so it's, it's a bit bizarre. Um, literally know nothing, but I know what I like to drink. So I kind of like the fact that when people come in and I can sense that someone also has no idea what they're fucking looking at on the list, <laughs> I can help them by bringing in that little bit of, you know what, you don't need to know what varietal that is or what producer that is. Let me just tell you, this is really fucking good juice. It's tasty and just, you know, like it's the one to go for. Um, and bringing in that kind of like this, I don't know, it's almost like this sense of ease, I feel like, with this venue. Um, and that's the stuff that I love. I love just, you know, going around, chatting to people, working my magic, as Nathan says, doing my mojo on the floor. <laughs> and um and ensuring that the guests have a great time. Uh, that's that's the thing that I love most about hospitality. And I actually can't believe it's taken me this long to get into the industry. So, yeah, it's, it's baffled me. <laughs> what surprised you about yourself and how you've reacted during this pandemic? Um, probably how quick I can get shit done when I really want something executed. And the juice traders in six days is a classic example. Um but I kind of feel like for myself, and, and I'm sure there's many others out there as well. But when you're pushed up, when you're pushed up against a wall, often that's when you can produce your best work. And I feel like, you know, I'm I'm known for being quite resilient. Um, but I also like to to go against the grain and almost and almost like the fact that I'm not from hospitality and I pretty much don't fit in. I like the fact that it's a challenge for me to try and make this place as successful as possible because. I haven't got, you know, decades of experience behind me. But what I do have is a real passion, respect and love for the hospitality sector and also the the guests that walk through the door. Um, and I just love to be able to have impact on that. Um, you know, and even looking at things like the Grow Assembly that Mira and Banjo are putting together, like shit like that. When I, when I hear about um, these little uh, – I, actually, I think that's going to be even more prevalent now um, post-COVID where you have these – um, little, I suppose, seminars or um, these little gatherings where it's about educating people in hospitality that this is actually a career. It's not a, It's not just a job. Um, and you can do this long term and you can do it by having great knowledge and experience and skill sets behind you by surrounding yourself with an industry who are only more too happy to help. Um, myself, like being mentored and guided by Mira and even um, Nikki have been some of the greatest assets to, to myself in the last, um, you know, six, seven months. So I think um, that's the stuff that I, that, I, that I absolutely love. You know, as restrictions ease and they let everyone back in restaurants, you know, and we're almost back to normal, um, how's it going to feel for you working the floor with a full restaurant again? um it'll be I can't wait it's going to be awesome I'm look I'm I'm not going to lie I've got a feeling that when all restrictions are completely lifted I'll probably end up locking the door and doing a locking and dancing on the bar I've done that once before in this venue um (laughs) so I wouldn't be surprised if we're celebrating pretty wildly Uh, but until then um you know, we're obviously going to stick to the guidelines and um, look forward to that day. We've got a rule. When when our guests sent our fr- uh, coming this Friday onwards, we don't talk about COVID shit. Like we want this to be a place where they can talk about other stuff, tell us about, you know, anything else but COVID. I feel like that's all people are talking about at the moment um, and it's it has its place but I feel like for the, the first time they're able to come out and enjoy a meal, that's the stuff we want to scrub from the table. Um, and, you know, we just want them to think about anything else but for that moment that they're with us. Well, Sally, uh, hats off to you and Nathan for sticking to your guns and doing this 100 your way and 50 your way and um, trying to set an agenda for the industry. And um, let's hope that the industry gets behind that kind of thing uh, moving forward. Uh, we really love chatting with you today. Um, 
good luck with everything and keep in touch. Thank you. Thank you, definitely. Thanks a lot. This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. Stay tuned as we share the stories of Australia's HOSPO community, suppliers and producers in search of hope during this pandemic. Special thanks to executive producer Rob Locke for making this all happen. Follow us on Instagram at Deep in the Weeds Podcast or email us at podcast at deepintheweeds.com.au. Stay safe and be well. <laughs>